Welcome to the Growing in Grace podcast, where you can listen in on some casual conversation about the good news of Jesus without all of the inconsistent religious double talk. If you've ever struggled with feelings of hopelessness, guilt, and despair, or wondered if you're really right with God, it's time to discover the true freedom that comes with the gospel of unlimited and overflowing grace. This the Growing in Grace podcast, growingingrace.org. I'm Joel Brzezinski with Mike Kapler, continuing on with our series on Hebrews. If we haven't said it before, I'm going to say it now. I know we've said it before, but I love this book of Hebrews. <laughs> I just, I love going through it. Years ago, it used to kind of uh, not scare me, but I just didn't understand a lot of what was said in Hebrews. And like we talked about last week, there were those two passages in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 that did scare me. But really, when I tried to read Hebrews, I just didn't understand it. But now, you and I, Cap, we've grown to see how much good news is in here and how this talks about Jesus and his superiority over the Old Covenant, how he himself, Jesus, supersedes and does away with the Old Covenant. We're getting into some really good chapters here in Hebrews that will really bring this out. Hebrews 7 is good uh, for this, but I just, I really love going through this stuff, and I really hope that as people are listening to this that they will get some really good information from us that will help them and encourage them in their walk with Jesus. Yes, that's what this is for, and um, I'm like you. I mean, Hebrews has become one of my favorite books because mm-hmm. it, it kind of just paints the picture of, of how things unfolded with the Jewish people, and then for all people, as it transitioned from an old covenant that became obsolete and came to an end into a, a new covenant that was established by Jesus Christ. I, the book of Isaiah actually refers to Jesus in, in a prophetic utterance that he would actually be the covenant. Mm-hmm. God would give Jesus to the people as a covenant and would become a light for the Gentiles as well. So that's all that's all in the Old Testament there. It's it, it just uh, sometimes it's it's hard to pluck that stuff out, but the writer of Hebrews here is is helping to I, I, generally speaking while he was writing this this letter, he was generally trying to to help Jewish people transition from that old way to this new way. People who had come to believe in Jesus but were also trying to sort out how the law figured into all of this. Well, you know, so that that's what we're getting into here. And, and we left off at the end of Hebrews chapter 6, Joel, where uh, a mention of Melchizedek was made there at the tail end of Hebrews chapter 6. And he continues to elaborate just a little bit further. But w- one thing is, as we go through this, uh, again, like we said last week and other weeks, don't get too caught up with a few verses here and there that seem confusing or, or you just, you're just not really sure what they're saying. This is all meant to be good news, and it's all meant to point people to something new and better, the new covenant, the person of Jesus Christ who, who became the high priest uh, in a different way than how priests were um, designated under the law. So that's what's going on here in chapter 7. Right, exactly. And it is, again, easy to get caught up in verses. So let's remember that there is context. The whole epistle, the writer is trying to point us to Jesus to show how Jesus is superior to the Old Covenant. There's a lot of Old Covenant talk in this, and then there's a lot of New Covenant talk. And he's pointing out the differences, you know, why the Old Covenant was in existence, and how Jesus himself came to be the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, how he became our great high priest as opposed to the Levites under the old covenant. They were the priests, and that priesthood was done away with. And chapter 7 really talks about this. Here it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. That <laughs> That phrase. Stop, stop right there. <laughs> How would so, you like that on your faith resume? <laughs> he he just slaughter slaughtered a bunch of people. Yeah. Who, um, Abraham. <laughs> all right. But it's easy to skim over that stuff. Right. Uh, so to whom Abraham also gave a tenth part of all. And a lot of people will focus in on that, thinking that this is about tithing. But he mentions that for a reason. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But again, that's one of those things. Don't get caught up on that right here. So Melchizedek, uh, his name first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. 
So Jesus is high priest according to the order of this guy, the king of righteousness and the king of Salem. Again, let's not get too caught up in who exactly is this Melchizedek because the writer brings out the point of what it's all about. We don't necessarily know the myst- all the mysteries about Melchizedek. Was he Jesus in the flesh back then? Was he a shadow? Uh, was he? Uh, you may have your own beliefs about that. That's okay, but it really doesn't say it here. So let's just read what the scriptures actually say. So he was without yeah, father. There's a, there's a bigger point to be made. There's agreed. a bigger point. That's it. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. He remains a priest continually. And that's a big point here. That's one of the big things here. He's a priest continually. The Levite priests, they died, and then new priests had to come about. And then they died, and the new priests had to come about. Well, this Melchizedek remains a priest continually, without father, without mother, no genealogy, no beginning of days, no end of life. So that's a big thing about Melchizedek. Now consider how great this man was, Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Again, it's not about the tenth of the spoils, but it's about how great Melchizedek was. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from people according to the law that is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, that's Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who made the promises Now beyond, and here's the big thing, now beyond all contradiction, the lesser, that's Abraham, is blessed by the better. That's what, that's one of the big points here. Abraham was the lesser, Melchizedek was the better. He was greater. So hold on to that thought. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. That's talking about Melchizedek. It's witness that he lives. He remains a priest continually. Mortal men... This is 2,000 years ago. The Levite priests were receiving tithes from the people. But there, talking about when Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, Melchizedek received them. So, and here's another point. Even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So I'll, I'll hand this back to you, but just get this picture in your head that Abraham, when he was slaughtering these kings and then he brought a tithe brought a tenth to Melchizedek the Levites had not been born yet they were in Abraham so because Abraham who is lesser than Melchizedek gave tithes to Melchizedek that means that the Levites who were in Abraham effectively gave tithes to Melchizedek the significance of this is not about tithing the significance is that Melchizedek is greater than than the Levites. That is the point that is made up to this point here. Yeah, the, the Levites being the, the tribe, you know, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the Levites were that tribe where they were put aside to just deal with the ministry. It, not everybody who was a Levite was necessarily a priest, but the priesthood came from that tribe. The Levites didn't inherit lands and cattle and such, and that's why the tithe was was given to them so that they would have food. But the point here, though, as we continue on, as you said, Joel, there's something that he's headed for here with this Melchizedek thing. And that's why I think you don't have to get all that caught up with who is Melchizedek because the scripture just isn't full of information on this. Right. But it appears that he is some type of Christ, like a, a reflection of Jesus, a king and a priest. And I, I like how you pointed out that he was not just the king of Salem, but the king of peace, the king of righteousness. This all resembles off of Jesus, Mm -hmm. by which our righteousness came from. It's like Jesus is almost like the fulfillment of of Melchizedek. Um, And so it's not based on genealogy, as as Joel just went through. Um, It's not based upon tribes as the priest. Good point, Joel. Priests, they came and they went. They, They were priests for a certain amount of time, and then they weren't. And they were appointed through the law, and yet Melchizedek had a, had a priesthood that was permanent. And uh, again, we're going to see the comparison here with Jesus. Verse 11 of, of Hebrews 7, if perfection was, and perfection, now that's a big deal, mm-hmm. if, uh, because Jesus talked about the requirement being perfection. You needed to be perfect. The law demanded perfection. That was the goal. 
and, and there were all these things in place within the law to try to help people reach that goal, but of course they all fell short. All of the people fell short of, of reaching the goal of perfection. So he's saying here in verse 11, if perfection th- uh, it was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron, the first high priest? For when the priesthood is changed, don't miss out on some of this now. Mm-hmm. When the priesthood is changed, of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. It's necessary that the law would change as well when the priesthood is changed. We're talking about a change of priesthood coming here that would occur through the person of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, there would have to be a change of law also. And that word change, by the way, doesn't just mean something that's tweaked. It means something brand new, something that is taken away and replaced with something fresh and unused. Uh, And while we just have a couple of minutes left here for this one, verse 13, for the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Now he's talking, he's going from, he's transitioning from Melchizedek to Jesus. The one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. What does he mean by that? Joel, I'm going to let you wrap this up, but the nutshell version on that is that Jesus didn't come from the tribe of Levi. You see, if the law was still going to continue and be in place, then Jesus would not be a, he cannot be considered a legitimate high priest because he came from a different tribe than the Levites. Okay, he came from the tribe of Judah. And Joel, I'll let you finish things up here. Yes, exactly. That's it. The writer makes the point again four or five times, quoting from Psalm 110.4, that Jesus is high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And this is contrasted with the Levites. Jesus does not come from the Levites. According to the law, the priests had to be of the Levites. And so if Jesus is going to be high priest... He comes from Judah, not from the Levites. So he has to, there has to be something else. There has to be a change of the law. And so Jesus comes from this order of Melchizedek. And I think the thing to point out there is that Melchizedek, again, no beginning, no end, no father, no mother, no genealogy, the power of an endless life. That's what was significant and superior about Melchizedek. So Jesus comes from that order, the order of the Levites, they died. And they had to keep offering sacrifices over and over again. And as we'll get to in chapter 8, 9, and 10, Jesus sacrificed himself once. So that's what's important about Melchizedek. Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek. He's high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. He came from Judah, so he couldn't have come from the Levites. And yet, it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. He testifies, you are high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And here is the point of all of this, verse 18. Well, it's one of the big points. For on the one hand, there is the annulling of the former commandment because because of its weakness and unprofitableness for the law made nothing perfect on the other hand there is the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to god we'll have to talk more about that next week right here on growing in grace at growingingrace.org this has been growing in grace with mike kapler and joel brzezinski heard online through various internet sources around the world each week Access past programs by visiting growingingrace.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.